you just type in the sound. Um, oh, that's so cool. Shiboya, Sequoia. She. Quo. Yeah. My Cherokee name is Ohiodli. And I was already grown before I found out what that meant. And that means um, dancing around the fire. That's the the religious ceremony, the stomp dance. But when you're dancing around that fire, that's what you're doing. Talk to us about food a little bit. Well, I guess uh, I learned to prepare traditional foods when my grandmother was still living. I learned how to, you know, uh, to skin corn uh, for cornmeal and then some of the desserts and of course all the traditional foods that we eat I learned um, when my grandmother was still living but of course um, being around my grand my mother and it's different we have a bread we call bean bread of course we have chestnut bread that you wrap in uh, leaves. You either use corn leaves or hickory leaves. Mm -hmm. And unfortunate, we've got hickory trees all around. It's very good to us, but people who didn't grow up eating it may not like it because it's bland. You have to pour grease over it. Of course, you got to have that fat back to make it taste even better. What's the Cherokee name for that bread? To you to show you. It mean, and literally means it has beans mixed in it. Hmm. Or, tilly, the shuyi, it has chestnuts in it. And we even use uh, sweet potatoes, cut them up and put it in there. Uh, Uniganasti shuyi, it has sweet potatoes in it. Uh, some people will wrap that bread in aluminum for. My grandmother would flip over in her grave if she knew I did that. <laughs> Can you talk to us about um, <clears throat> some greens? Oh yeah, well there's sochan. Grows along damp areas, usually around, you know, like branches. It's called crow's foot. Is there a Cherokee name for this? Uh-huh. Anachkwalunkski. It means it breaks apart. But it has nothing to do with breaking apart. It's uh, it has three leaves to it, and very strong. You have to boil it and rinse it. Boil it again, rinse it again, and then season it. That grows, you know, along the damp areas like sochan. So. Here is what could be called the number one Cherokee green. It's certainly the one I hear from my friends about over and over again. And um, they call it Sochan. And it's uh, related to black-eyed Susie or Echinacea, if you know those flowers. And if you taste it, you might wonder why it's their favorite green, because it tastes kind of like a flower. Or maybe parsley, or even looks like a kind of a giant parsley. So if you like parsley, you might like this, but you wouldn't eat it raw like parsley. So a little bit is okay, but you have to cook it. So you get a whole mess of them and cook it up like spinach. And um, so chan's the name. And you can see that it's, it's dying back. So the ones I wanna pick are the, are the small ones that are coming back in the fall. I wanted to do everything my grandmother did I wanted to help her, you know. Sometimes it was a lot of work, and I wish I hadn't volunteered to help, but, you know, I learned early on that that's how you learned, was by helping. I grew up when, you know, times were kind of hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you help, you know, in the cornfields and in the gardens, and you help gather mushrooms uh, 
the vegetables that grew up in the mountains. So here's another Cherokee food, kind of mushroom called a boli. So I usually dry these and powder it into soup. But if we find a young one, it'll be a bit more firm. All right, so this mushroom will grow with pine trees. And here is the tree. It's not always that obvious. The tree could be 50 yards away, you know, going under a road, and the mushroom will be on the other side because connected to the roots is the fungus that helps this tree grow and vice versa. But if the mushroom's not out, then you can always eat the tree. In fact, Yul Gimmitz, famous uh, wild foods expert, his famous line was, ever eat a pine tree? And uh, sure enough, you might have had pine nuts, but you may not have known that you could, could just chew on these leaves. Of course, they're a bit tough and resinous, but you can make some pretty fancy cocktails nowadays with uh, something that's all over the place. So, the supermarket of the woods, I've heard this called. My grandparents, um had big corn fields. Corn being the main staple of our foods. They raised a lot of green beans. And of course they had fruit trees. I can remember seeing um, dried apples hanging. They had a, one room separate from the living quarters where there was pumpkins hanging, dry, drying peaches, apples, cabbage. She would uh, quarter cabbage, string them up just the same way she did her green beans and hang them up. As a way of preserving mm -hmm. And of course they um, raised hogs. And it's neat how they preserved uh, hog meat. It was cut into little pieces and fried. And then all that meat was put into big crocks. Grease was poured on top of it. Oh, that was so delicious. I'd come home from school in the evenings and I'd get, we call them gunzoon, wooden spoons and dig in there and get a piece of, you know, cooked pork. Uh, what I dreaded the most was my grandmother raised clay peas. When they dried, it was so hard, you know, having to shell those clay peas. It's hard on the fingers. I dreaded it when it was time. They'd bring in all the dried clay peas and, you know, bushel bags, and we would sit at night. They would talk, tell their stories while we shell those clay peas. They would talk about the old days and, you know, tell myths and legends. Do you remember any of them? I remember some. Is there one you want to tell us for the camera? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, what would, like as a kid, what would have been that favorite story? My favorite story, I don't mind sharing that with you at all, was about ginseng. Um, the healers. Now, Cherokee, be they men or women, don't like to be called medicine man or medicine woman. That's a unique way. That's a unique word. But the healers, but it was the men. They would get together once a year off somewhere in a secluded place and they would share their knowledge. They would do this for four nights. Well, the first night, they had smoke, you know, passed the pipe around, and they got started. And it was always the eldest down to the youngest that would start talking, sharing their knowledge of medicine. And they had talked, and it got down, and all of a sudden, there's a young man sitting there. They didn't even notice that he had joined their group. And he politely waited, because he was the youngest, till it was his turn, and he spoke. 
and just amazed the other healers to be so young, but very knowledgeable. Well, when they had completed talking, he was gone. And they're asking each other, who was that? Well, she's young, but he's very knowledgeable. Does anybody, did anybody know him? Nobody knew him. Nobody knew where he was from. So the second night, the same thing happened. So he waited politely to be the last to talk. And when they were finished, he got up and left. Did anybody find out who he was? Where he's from? No. The third night. Well, before he arrived, they said, now tomorrow night, we got to find out where his people are from, who he is. So the pick the youngest of the elders said, now tomorrow night, as soon as he gets through talking, you follow him. So it was planned. So the fourth night, they talked. And as soon as he finished talking, that youngest of the elders got up and followed him. And he went around the mountain towards the north. And he stayed right behind him. And all of a sudden, he just disappeared. He went right to where he last saw him. And there stood a beautiful ginseng. That's why the ginseng is so sacred to us. The best way to learn is from so someone else. I mean, any skill, not just foraging. And if you break that chain, you have what I went through, which is to learn from books, which is the dumbest way to learn. People think I was smart to go to Princeton, but you actually have to be smart not to go to school at all. You know, that's the really smart person. And what I did was I was very good at doing what I was told, which is to, to learn from books. And um, you don't have any traditional culture of people foraging who learn that from a book. And when people ask me, how do you, can you tell this poisonous one from that one? Are there any books you can use? I tell them, did you use a book to learn cabbage from iceberg lettuce? You, you, did you go to school for that? Did your parents even ever sit you down to do that? So you learn from experience, and that experience comes with your parents, because I had someone tell me, yeah, you know, when I was a kid once, my mom sent me to the store to get iceberg lettuce, and I came back with a cabbage. And I said, well, that's, you know, that proves the rule. Like, your parents, you know, corrected you. So preservation is important in the sense that the only field guide worth having is one with two legs. It's a mentorship model, you know, an apprenticeship model of learning. Myrtle, do you have a, uh, anyone that's in the younger generation that is interested in food here within the community and cooking? Oh, yes. My granddaughter. Uh, you saw the picture in there of Chicky Lily. Mm -hmm. Now, she's learned. She knows how to make the breads. She knows how to find mushrooms. But, you know, the, the sochan, crow's foot, all that she knows. She's the one grandchild that could survive out. <laughs> Do you feel like a lot of other families are sort of having that same dynamic happen where you people are passing along and the young ones are actually, some of the young ones are interested in continuing that way of Not cooking? Not that many. Really? I know my, my friend Martha and I are always talking about, oh gosh, those kids that starved to death. It was something, you know, catastrophic happened, you know. If they couldn't get to a hospital to, or to a grocery store, they'd die <laughs> or starve to death. But I think my granddaughter, she could make it. We know that the Southeastern Indians were unusual in that they possessed 
um, a way of making a living which combined in fairly even proportions the hunting and gathering of wild foods with, along with the cultivation of domesticated foods. That means they were both hunters and farmers, you know, which is really cool. You know, obviously their farming was not on a level that we've taken it, you know, mass production of this or that with fertilizers and pesticides and things. And that's where Alan's argument is that it's wrong and it's, it is wrong indeed, you know. Right. But they grew their own vegetables. They had gardens as well as hunted, as well as foraged, you know. They had the, and that's how they lived off the land. And they wouldn't have been here for so damn long had that not worked for them, yeah. you know. And had had the uh, the colonists and, and and everyone learned those techniques from them, you know. Because it's I mean it's a matter of fact. I mean this uh, my the folks that uh, my family that grew up in you know eastern North Carolina learned hunting and trapping from the native uh, the Native Americans that were there, the Torscaroran tribes and the Toysnot tribes and stuff like that. And, there's a huge reservation there in Eastern Carolina, not too far from Wilson. So, I mean, you know, I have great grandfathers and great uncles, distant uncles that hunted and trapped there. All through the, all through the generations of the Civil War, you know, I have a, uh, an uncle that fled the Confederacy from being shot in Maryland, in Campton's Gap, Maryland, fled and deserted, came back to the Tar River, and uh, lived in the Tar River for three and a half years in a cave with several other Confederate deserters and hunted and trapped and fished that river to survive until the war was over. You know, Dorsey Pridgen was his name. And he did that because of what they learned from the natives, you know. There was a man that lived down below where my grandma and grandpa lived that used to grind up the corn. That's how he got his cornmeal. He got a little bit of the cornmeal when we take our corn to him. And then they, they bartered too, because I remember we didn't have cows. And my grandparents, uh, but the people that lived across the river had cows. So my grandma would trade like uh, the clay peas and her, the hominy and cornmeal that she made in exchange for milk, sweet milk, and buttermilk, and butter. Oh, that was the life. Do you have any, anything that you can share with us or any words of wisdom for us for that at all when it comes to, you know, Cherokee food? Throw away your measuring spoons. <laughs> you know, that's, I have measuring spoons but when I'm, I only use them when I'm cooking white man's food. <laughs> when I'm cooking, you know, our traditional foods. Oh, a spoon of, I mean, a pinch of this, a pinch of that. I see, oh, that looks like, mmm, about two or three, you know, teaspoons of baking soda, maybe. But I don't use the rest, even for cakes, I don't. I don't use the recipe. I taste it. If it tastes right raw, it's going to taste good when it's cooked. <laughs>